You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hello, and thank you for joining us for yet another episode of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And tonight we're joined by Kristen DeProto from Slocum & Sons, one of the major distributors here in Connecticut. Kristen, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. And we're really excited about this episode because last year we had a pairing of wine with chocolate. And this year we figured we'd go all out and do aphrodisiacs that pair with wine. So sort of an aphrodisiac show. Great food, great wine and stuff that I think is going to be a very, in for a very exciting evening. And uh, Chris, what, what can you tell us about our first kava that we're gonna be drinking this evening? Well, I brought Aria, which is uh, made by Sigura Vudas. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Freshenet. Yes. Um, they own Sigura Vudas and um, Aria is kind of their step up from the Sigura Vudas Brut brand. It is a, um, Kind of a, you know, it's a really great quality kava at that price point. And I brought kava as opposed to champagne because um, I'm kind of a nerd for Spanish wine. I lived in Spain Who for isn't? a while. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I remember when I was in Barcelona, there was this little, um, you know, champagne place that I'm not going to pronounce because I don't want to ruin it. But there was people literally sticking out of the windows of this place every night drinking kava. And it's kind of stuck with me. And I thought this would be a really brilliant way to start any sort of um, pairing, especially with the wonderful... Yeah, Bob and I love cavas, yeah. and they usually command a lower price point than champagne. They do. So that's one of the reasons we drink them frequently. Mm -hmm. And they uh, taste great. But, they, but that's and that's the other reason is yeah. that you get the same quality that you get with champagne. Yep, it's actually made the same way. Um, the method way, the way this one's actually made is the same way that champagne the, and high-end sparkling wines the are method made. Method champagne was. Yes, okay. correct. And that's it's one of the most uh, underappreciated, I think, wines uh, come from Spain. And so I really wanted to kind of shine some light on how great it could be. Well, I know it's not underappreciated on our fact because no. we drink a lot of it. So okay. I already sense a nice aroma of yeah, a bouquet from this really already. Great. It's um, So the cava is made from uh, Parallera, Girello, and Macabeo. Really mm -hmm. lovely. Great are, taste. I love the taste. Good aftertaste. It's, yep. You get a little bit of fruit with this. And um, not that yeasty taste that you have a lot of champagnes. Absolutely. None Correct. at all. Especially it's, when you have something that's uh, made with the method Champenoise. Mm -hmm. they, they add yeast for the second fermentation, and that tends to kind of bubble up during the, mm -hmm. when yep, you're drinking in the it. bottle, yep, as well, yep, absolutely. And what's, so. what's great about this is, because this is our aphrodisiac show for Valentine's Day, that's gonna probably pay very, pair very well with our oyster that we're going to be having with it yes. later on. So Big I'm fan looking of forward to that. Big well, let's fan. go ahead and try it. All right, does everybody have, let me give myself yeah. another little pour. Are we doing this classy with forks, or are we just going? No, to you should be able to drink it right out of my little right. container. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to try to look appropriate and, and eat this. Folks at home, this is our little oyster container because I didn't want to bring the whole shell in. So. Big fan of oysters. They're fantastic, and and they're considered an aphrodisiac because they're full of zinc, and a, a lot of the foods we're going to talk about tonight have extra little, you know. Uh, Mm. nutritional benefits to them as well as being considered an aphrodisiac and that's a lot of times that's what makes them an aphrodisiac is they they increase blood flow or they've got uh, you know some B vitamins or in in oysters case uh, they've got zinc so that was very enjoyable and this did taste very good yep. after eating the oyster I think it's got oyster. a lot of roundness in the wine that actually really kind of relates well with the, the roundness of the oyster and yeah and the, the finish minerality. the finish yeah. completely changes Absolutely. after the oyster goes down so then sometimes like you, can, you can get an oyster a little on the saltier side. This wasn't too salty. No. Super so, briny. Yeah. Really so this uh, was really good with this particular uh, tasting. So. Look at me finishing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's what we do here. Well, you're slacking we, there. Oh, you're right. Sorry. <laughs> Don't do that We do have all. a few others to get to. I apologize. <laughs> all right. So what is our second one? Yeah, go ahead and tell us about so, this. So um, I brought Veramonte Sauvignon Blanc. 
Um, Veramonte is um, in uh, the Casablanca Valley in Chile, which is a really beautiful part of Chile. Um, it's actually kind of a really temperamental place to, to grow grapes. Um, um, and this particular wine is made by um, a really famous uh, winemaking family. Um, are you guys familiar with Augustin Huneus? I actually think I read an article about him, about, about him online one time. Okay. He's been um, around for a while, hasn't he? He has. He's originally from Chile. Um, he owns uh, properties in California. He owns the Quintessa property. He makes Faust, um, Prisoner, Illumination. This is his property down in Chile. He's got a few, um, another which we'll get to. But um, this is a really great, uh, easy drinking Sauvignon Blanc, very affordable. Um, and for someone who's not completely, um, you know, in love with the idea of New Zealand. Um, this is actually a really nice riff on old, uh, almost a French style, a little bit grassier, great minerality. Oh, there's my favorite, the terroir. I'm a yes. big French guy. <laughs> As you guys know, I do love to say the word terroir in my wine. So I'm curious to see what this is gonna taste like. Once again, a very mild it is. aroma for a Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, and there's, there's not a whole lot of that citrus that you get with some of the other Sauvignon Blancs we've had on the show. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a little, Creamier, and mm -hmm. I do get some minerality with this. That's a great word, creamier. I would definitely yeah. say this is one of the more creamier Sauvignon mm -hmm. Blancs we tasted on the show. Mm -hmm. Some yeah. of the Sauvignon Blancs get very acidic. Yep. And, and this has a much better mouthfeel. Well, it's all about balance, I think. And this particular wine, you can tell in the winemaking that they strive to, to kind of meet somewhere in the middle with the acidity and the fruit. And I think that, um, obviously, you can tell that this is a really well-thought-out wine. And really, all the Veramonte wines are... Uh, they have a whole line of really beautiful wines from the Casablanca Valley. The 2011, was that a vintage that really stands out, or is this... Uh... Um, you know, I think that this particular vintage is, you know, it's only going to get a little bit better um, as time goes on, but I would definitely drink it in the next year or two. Um, you know, obviously Sauvignon Blanc is something you want to drink while it's relatively young. Right. Um, but, I, you know, I think that this is maybe a, a little bit grassier than um, the 10, which was probably mm -hmm. a little greener to me, but... Uh, personal opinion, everyone's tastes are a little different. So. No, you're right. And uh, we discussed this before the start of the show, and I know generally you would have this chilled a little bit more. A little bit more, um, yeah. This is just slightly below room temperature, but it's still very, has a very yep. good taste to it. I think in the summertime, it's really great to have wines like this mm -hmm. a little bit colder because you're outside or you want them to be a little more refreshing. But traditionally, uh, if you're going to get a little bit more of the flavor out of the wine, you want them to be closer to you know yeah. 50 degrees and not super cold right. because you don't get a lot of those like flavor profiles that come out in the wine until they're a little bit you know yeah bob and i did a whole show on wine oh, temperatures perfect. and uh so you but thank you for so refreshing our memories the choir here. no, no I, you could never absolutely. preach to the choir <laughs> that, but that was my point was you get a wine too cold mm -hmm. and the flavor just disappears absolutely and absolutely. now what are we going to be pairing with this one jim well actually this was Kristen's pick uh mm -hmm. this is asparagus and i've, I've done a, a white and a green asparagus uh, with gorgonzola and some shallots uh, and um, a kind of a vinegar, uh, balsamic vinegar dressing. So Great. Go ahead and just take a, a little yeah, bit of the asparagus. Asparagus is, is an aphrodisiac, and it's one of those things where a lot of people, I, I think, it could be daunting to figure out what to pair it with, but there's so many great grassy qualities in asparagus already that go really well with this particular wine. Let me take one of these guys. Ooh, white asparagus too. Awesome. And for our viewers, you know we've talked about doing an actual food show. So, uh, so far, we haven't had any major mishaps with the food. <laughs> so, there you go. Oh, thank you. I was about to eat with my hands. But that's fine <laughs> go also. Right go asparagus right ahead. is a finger food. Don't <laughs> let is. anyone tell you any different. You know, I agree with you. <laughs> Uh, they, back in the 17th century, they said that asparagus actually stirred up the lust in men and women. So this is, this really? is probably why it makes it has become an aphrodisiac today. All right. Well, Jim, your asparagus is quite delicious. Yeah. Well, we will, we will post all these recipes online. So if you want to make these at home for Valentine's Day, you can do some of the pairings that we're doing here tonight. Uh, the, the recipes are pretty simple. I remember what we're doing tonight is just to give you some thoughts or ideas for either couples or even if you're just home alone and you want to do something a little bit different or exciting for Valentine's Day, trying these particular foods that we have tonight paired with maybe one of these wines or one of your own choosing, I think is a, it's a great way to spend Valentine's Absolutely. Day. Absolutely. And if you can't do it at a restaurant, do it at home with your significant yep. other and mm -hmm. enjoy. Yeah, and this, this wine has a great finish now. It's, uh, you know, it's still kind of lingering. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those wines that you drink, they just fade away instantly. And this, mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is staying with me. And I, and I really like this pairing, actually, because there's a certain uh, astringency 
to asparagus mm -hmm. that I think has a very like similar quality that I don't know if, if you guys are getting it too, but when you drink it together, it kind of matches in a really kind of cool way. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. And actually, that's one of the reasons I actually like Sauvignon Blanc myself personally, even without this pairing, because a lot of Sauvignon Blanc has that sort of, as you said earlier, the acidity. Mm -hmm. This one is not as acidic, but it has that more minerally mm -hmm. and worldly characteristic in the uh, worldly. <laughs> in the wine. I like that. Awesome. Now this is just going back to your French preference. You know, Jim, <laughs> I keep talking about French wine. We've never done an all-French show, but we will do that maybe in the spring or summer. Ooh, call me when you guys do that. All okay, right. Well, we'll do that. <laughs> I'd be happy. We've got some great, great French wines. So so far, Chris, the first two have been spectacular. Great. So far, so good. Two and I, I yeah. see that Primus there, and I'm somewhat familiar with it. I haven't had it in quite a while. I can actually remember the last time I had it, so please fill us in on the Primus. Um, so the Primus, similarly to the Veramonte, um, has its roots in the same winemaking family. Um, it comes from uh, one of the same uh, winemakers, actually, uh, Rodrigo so uh, Soto, who actually works for the Huneas family. And um, Primus has a lot of really great wines in Chile, but this is their Malbec from Mendoza, Argentina. It's a high altitude um, altitude. Um, Malbec there, and I thought this would be really kind of cool um, because a lot of times I think when you're thinking like, you know, pairing with something for entrees, you don't want anything that's going to overwhelm, mm -hmm. and I thought that this um, mushrooms and Malbec mm -hmm. would be kind of a really great fit together just because there are a lot of unique qualities to Malbec, and I find that people either really like it or they really don't like Malbec. It's, it's kind of one or the other, right. and this is a beautiful expression of Malbec, and um, We'll see how it goes. I don't know. Very I mild bouquet. I get a little vanilla on the nose. Beautiful but color, though. Beautiful color. Mm -hmm. And so it's got some great legs, too. Yep. Well, it, and actually, it's, um, it spends about 12 to probably 14 months in French and American oak. Um, it does have a little bit. Um, Malbec is a predominant grape in this one. It does have a tiny bit of other blending grapes in there, but it is the, you know, the strongest varietal in there. It's just slightly tannic, but it's not, it's not overbearing. And sometimes... Mm -hmm. Uh, some people love a lot of tannins. I, I personally don't, but um, this has, for me, the right amount. It's, it's just a hint of it. Yeah, before we even go into the tasting or the pairing with, with this one, I will say this is actually in a way similar to the Seven Blanc because it's smooth. Right. It has a creaminess yeah, to it. Yeah, it's got a great mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. So uh, another great choice for what you brought in tonight because they both complement each other in distinctly different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get the strong, sometimes burning flavor in the back right. of your throat. Mm -hmm. I think in progressive pairings too, sometimes, especially when you're pairing food, you don't want things that are going to be too opposed uh, course to course because um, it can be a little bit harsh. Um, obviously, these are kind of on the opposite ends of the spectrum varietal wise, but um, you know, I think that the quality of the grapes and the quality of the, you know, the winemaking mm -hmm. and the finish kind of, you know, you can really kind of match things well. Yeah, I'm not afraid of, of serving a couple of different varietals during a dinner, mm -hmm. you know, especially if you're doing what we're doing tonight, which is trying to match it specifically with what you're eating. And I, I think, well, Bob, goes, this goes back to what Bob was saying, is these aren't two wines that are really going to clash with each other. Right. Not at all. I think, I think right. they work well. If you're going to do a, a full four-course dinner like we are here, <laughs> these, these are some great selections. We're just speeding through it. So now comes the actual <laughs> tasting of the food oh, and excited. then having some more of the, uh, the wine. All right, this is uh, porcini mushroom and shiitake mushroom with a uh, sherry cream sauce. And again, this was your recommendation, Kristen. So. And this is where his cooking skills come into question. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see how well I've done here. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be awesome. Well, Jim, you haven't disappointed me. <laughs> I've had a lot of practice coming over to your house, Bob. Nice. So. You really got a lot of flavor in that sauce. Mm. Now, one of the things I wanted to mention is a lot of times people you know, base their pairings. We've been taught a lot about, you know, use your protein to base your wine. This is a really great example of it. it's pasta, it's a cream sauce, but you're not necessarily going to go for a white. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you always got to kind of go with the flavor profile of what you're cooking. And with mushrooms having a strong, like kind of earthy flavor, you can really lend yourself to a wine like this that's got a lot of uh, substance to it. When I took a sip after eating that, I mean, you can definitely... There's a cornucopia of excitement going yes. on in my mouth yeah, yeah. right now. A, lot of, a whole lot of different... You're not overwhelmed. Whenever I can say cornucopia on the show, <laughs> in my mouth is always a good thing. So Great. that's... Uh, the mushroom, I guess because it's an earthy, earthy type... It's not a vegetable, is it? Not no, really. it's a fungus. It's a fungus. Yeah. 
Okay, it sort of is not very romantic, <laughs> but uh, just think of it as a mushroom instead of a fungus. But it is an aphrodisiac. It is an aphrodisiac. And this also has garlic in it. So we're actually doubling down on aphrodisiacs wow. with this dish. Now, garlic has allicillin in it, which great. increases the blood flow. It's which true. is that. Which uh, is kind of ironic, because sometimes garlic actually repels the two getting together. But if it's done in moderation, as your sauce or, Well, is, as long as you're both eating the garlic. Listen, yeah. I'm a huge fan of garlic. And, you know, anything, as long as you're both eating it, you know, it's perfect. And it also, like, elevates your heart rate a little mm -hmm. bit, gets your blood flowing. Yep. All good things for, you know, what you're trying to accomplish on Valentine's Day. <laughs> well, what's great about doing a food show, finally, after going into our second year, is we can now finally talk about what certain wines taste like after eating a bite of different food. Right. And this is really great. This pairing with this red is probably something we've tried to talk about in past shows, but having to taste the food and, and drink the wine, it's, it's so much more enjoyable. So much more enjoyable. So I'm going to keep eating. That's how enjoyable. <laughs> Don't mind me. I, I guess you like my recipe. I do, actually. Well, we can't pour the next wine until your glass is empty. Oh, anyway, geez. So. All right. Well, we've got an empty over there. We do. I, you know what? I'll never be the one to slack, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep up the pace here. Now, the Primus, do they make other varietals besides the Malbec? They do. Um, there's actually... Um, the red blend is in the top 100 right now, Wine Spectator. Oh, wow. It's a really beautiful wine, too. If you haven't seen this wine yet, I highly recommend it. It's um, Carmenere, Cab, a little Merlot, a little mm. Syrah. Um, really brilliant wine. So we'll need a little bit of more information on our, our last wine this evening because it's certainly something I've never tasted before. This last wine here, I, I kind of decided to go a little bit non-traditional. I know for desserts, a lot of people tend to go chocolate yes. on Valentine's Day. I find that you don't want to overwhelm your dessert or your palate. Um, sometimes chocolates can be a little bit harder to pair with. So I thought bringing a dessert wine would be cool. And I also thought that bringing a non-traditional dessert item would be cool. So um, I recommended baklava because it has two aphrodisiacs. It actually has honey and nuts, uh, which are both known aphrodisiacs. So I thought, what better to pair that with, with um, than honey wine? Um, this is a Polish honey wine. It's pronounced Naleska, Babuni Honey. Um, it's, uh, I think it has apple wine as a base, mm -hmm. is the kind of the, the base spirit. There's an infusion of honey. Delicious um, aroma, even before I bring it up to my face, I can smell it. Now, I love honey. You wouldn't drink this like you would drink a glass of wine. It's a little bit higher alcohol content, mm -hmm. so you're not going to fill up a glass. It's a little bit more like a schnapps that you'd pour just kind of a little, little bit of and enjoy. glass. Yep. Yeah. Um, and the important thing to remember with desserts is you always want to pair a dessert wine with something. Um, not as sweet as the wine. Right. Because if you're going to, you know, have the dessert and it's going to be subtle and the wine is kind of subtle, it kind of mutes both of the flavors. So you always want a little wine that's a little bit sweeter than the dessert. Yeah, this goes back to our, our uh, Valentine's show last year. We were doing chocolate pairings and that was, it was the same rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. You wanted the wine just a little bit sweeter than the chocolate. Right. And uh, we had the correct pairings and then we kind of mixed things up and, and the chocolates didn't work with the wines that, mm. that they weren't supposed to go with. So This is delicious. Good, I know it's higher in alcohol, but uh, you don't really get that right off the bat. Um, it's certainly no, very smooth. Very smooth. And I'm, I'm a sucker for honey. Very smooth, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's got a huge honey aroma. Sure does. That just hits you before you even get the glass to your nose. Which is why I have to ask, Chris, why did you think baklava would pair well with this? Um, well, when we were talking previously about aphrodisiacs, and I was kind of going through the, the known list of aphrodisiacs and kind of thinking like what would work, um, and chocolate not being one that actually works really well with wine, I was thinking almonds and honey, and I, I had a, a friend when I was a child that was Greek, and we used to get dragged to these like Greek festivals. Oh, the old these, Greek festivals, yeah. Oh my <laughs> gosh, like two days long, and people dancing around, and you get dragged into these circles. And I remember having baklava as a kid and absolutely loving it. So I was like, wow, that has two of those qualities. So I don't know, I just kind of thought it'd be fun. And non-traditional, which is great. Well, we're about to find out. Yeah, yeah let's go well, for I it. I think this is a genius, genius pick for right. uh, dessert here. Thank you for calling me a genius. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, we've doubled down on aphrodisiacs. Yes, yeah, so you're kind of tripling in it right now. You've got alcohol, honey, nuts. Mm. Can't go wrong. What do we think? I really, Jim, you got to really admire. Our guest has the manners with the fork and knife. And I've just resorted to using my hands. Oh, I don't have manners. I, I'm, I have manners for everyone right now. <laughs> I'm trying. Is it good? You know, actually the honey wine, or the honey in the wine, does temper the honey in the baklava. It, yeah. it sort of neutralizes it so you don't get like a double dose of honey. Right. You sort of sort of moderates the flavor of both the baklava yeah, and the wine. Yeah, you're right. Wow. Good choice, good choice. Cool. Yeah, I'm actually um, 
um, surprised and happy at the same time. I haven't had as much experience. I kind of was winging it with this particular pairing because I hadn't actually had it, but I had just thought they would be really great together. So I'm glad it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> actually, this particular, it is a wine, obviously. You would call it a wine. It is a honey wine. What would you usually serve that with if it wasn't for the baklava? Like, was that more of a... Uh, like I said, aperitif, or is that something you drink before drink, dinner, after dinner, or it doesn't really matter? Um, I would say this uh, falls into the category of after dinner, typically. Um, I know this particular um, brand, they have, uh, especially, they're, you know, probably six generations old, um, and they make fruit wines, and a lot of fruit wines are typically drank after dinner. Mm -hmm. You throw them through little cordial glasses, and you kind of sit and talk as a family, and that's been the, you know, the generational history with those types of wines. So I would say um, the pairing is a bonus, but this is something that's just a really lovely, you know, kind of riff on if you want to take a different road than Grand Marnier or mm -hmm. Port, you know, if you want to just sip on something really lovely after dinner. Uh, when you say fruit wines, are you talking about ice wines or fruit infusion wines? Fruit infusion. Okay. So um, they have a raspberry. I believe mm -hmm. they use a lot of apple. Um, you know, and, and typically it's, they reserve the best quality fruit to make these wines in Poland. Um, so this is a luxury item maybe for Poland, um, but it's something that we could get here in the States, you know, fairly reasonably priced. Um, okay. Does Slocum carry actually, some of the other fruit wines from we this do. thing? Okay. We do. Uh, we do have a few, uh, a few of them. And actually in regards to price points, where do these fall in roughly? These are all really fantastic values, which is, uh, the other reason I brought these is that it's extremely accessible. Um, all under $20. Um, you know, you could probably, the range on the Veramonte, you know, between 10 and $12 mm -hmm. retail, uh, Primus, you know, some uh, all under 20 I'm shocked that the, the honey wine is under 20 So I would I. have expected that to be $40, $50. I would think that would be the price point, too. Yeah. I, it definitely has the, a lot of qualities that would kind of, you know, hold it up to be a, a luxury liqueur, mm -hmm. but it's definitely accessible and, and um, very affordable. Do you find that of uh, Polish wines in, in general, that they're priced well below what you'd get from France or Spain or, or California? Um, not necessarily. I think it just kind of depends on, you know, where the wine is derivative from and the winemaking and how big the production is. And okay. there's so many variables in wine. Are there more <laughs> types of Polish wines rather than what we're drinking tonight? Like there... there are. I am not the expert on Polish wine, but I will say there are many kinds of Polish spirits and wines um, we could spend all day probably talking about. Well, I know we could probably spend all day talking about Polish beer, <laughs> which I'm a big proponent of, by the way. I should have brought Polish beer. Uh, well, this we is not a beer show. No, actually, Jim, I've been, I've been toying with maybe doing just one beer tasting. Two, just, guys, two guys, a lot, a lot of wine, wine and, and a beer. Yeah. Only because beer does sometimes have the same characteristics as wine. There's a lot of flavor profiles. Mm -hmm. Generally, yeah. uh, beer, though, has to be drunk cold, which is very difficult to do mm -hmm. in the short time we have on the show. Unless you're in Europe and you go to a bar and they give you a yeah. draft you, beer that's room temperature. You go to England, it's room temperature. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, we can't have that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we no, cannot we have that. Yeah. So how did you end up getting in the wine business to begin with? Just something that was always your passion? or? Uh, no, not really, actually. I'm a writer by um, nature. Um, I worked in restaurants, actually, for the better part of my entire existence, um, or what feels that way. Um, I was in Chicago prior to uh, Connecticut last year. Uh, I was managing restaurants out in Chicago and helping people with their beverage programs, and um, it's one of those things where you just start to say, you know, like, I can't quit you. That's how the liquor business has yeah. been for me. As far as I try to run, um, it always you, keeps you coming back. You got too far into it. And, I did. Yeah. And, and now, you know, it's one of those things I came here and serendipity as it was, I, I decided to um, jump back in both feet. And I really, I love what I do. It's fantastic. I mean, how can you hate talking about wine all day? <laughs> well, that's you're what you're studying to become a sommelier. I am. I am, actually. Um, I'm, I'm quite a nerd. <laughs> now, you're not going to get too stuffy for us now, are you? Seriously? <laughs> I'm the least stuffy person you'll ever meet. I was going to eat this with my hands until I decided there was silverware. So. Well, you'll notice I went back to the sparkling. Great because way to finish. I think that might be another example of something sweet at the end of the night. Oh, you want to try that with the baklava? I think I'm going to try oh, yeah. it with, you know, the, that's a great idea, with the champagne or the, the kava. You know what? I'm going to blow your minds right now. Little kava in the honey wine. Wow. You're going to mix them. I am going to mix right. them because actually what could be better than adding a really dry, sparkling uh, wine with something decadent like a honey wine? That is a phenomenal idea. Mm -hmm. Now, mine is gone. 
<laughs> but Should we pour wait, wait, a little more? No, as a designated host tonight, <laughs> okay, I will let Jim and our guest uh, decide what Someone has to be in control, to be in control here. So, cheers. Cheers, Thank everybody. Cheers. Yay. I hope this works out. You know, it's not quite as good as with the uh, Polish honey wine. Very good. It works. At least just the champagne for me was not as good. So that works better for you guys. Is it because of yeah. the sweetness? Or? Yeah, I think the sweetness of the uh, cava takes away a little bit of the... Too uh, much for the baklava. Yeah. Okay. How was your pairing with the uh, two com combinations? I'm a big I fan. I liked it. I liked it. And, you know, you, you see a lot of people dropping fruit into champagne all the time. You know, mm -hmm. strawberries or raspberries. Uh, I, I never would have thought of doing some kind of honey aperitif into a... I, bubbly, but it works. I'm of the belief that sparkling anything makes everything better. So <laughs> that is true. I, I, I love <laughs> As we have learned many times. I mean, maybe not like with drinking. Bailey's or something, but in this particular situation, any sort of fruit. Yeah. Sparkling. Well, uh, yeah, you get the you get the mimosa or the Bellini. Absolutely. Though sometimes you don't want to mix up two either a cava or champagne with anything that's too. If it's a good cava or champagne, you certainly don't want to dilute it at all. Right. Depends on how much of it you have. Right. Experimental purposes, perhaps. Okay. But if you have endless champagne. We've come close with endless <laughs> champagne a few times, Jim. But unfortunately, if you drink too much champagne and don't mix it up a little bit, it's just a little too sweet for the evening. That's and true. we've learned that lesson the hard way many times. This is really yeah. great baklava. Oh, this is Bob. Bob brought the baklava. Yes, I'd like so. to thank Tangiers for that. Uh, as many of our West Hartford residents know, they mm. make great food. They have uh, great Greek food and other uh, nationalities. So. Uh, Thank you to them. And uh, where did the oysters come from? <coughs> the oysters are from the Crab Shack, which used to be Tinker, so I want to thank them too. Jim, I want to thank you for your delicious recipe. Well, the, the recipes, and this is all, Kristen, this is your ideas. I just went online and looked them up, and we will be posting these <laughs> online. Everything will be uh, online today. Yeah. Uh, so please, uh, you know, the wines, again, everything. friend us on Facebook. Uh, send us a message on Facebook if you have a question or comment for us. Um, we, we would like to respond to anything that you have, uh, any kind of questions you have. So, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Yes. Happy Valentine's Until Day. Until next time, I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And keep us in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.